you know, when I think back, I don't know how I did it. We have such reverence for vintage wines, ancient museums, books, paintings. I seem to have a reverence for old people. We are going to see my friend Risa, who I've been filming since I met her teaching years ago, since she was about 85. She is 99. Her birthday is November 1st. Hoping she'll make 100. So I met Risa when I was teaching dance at the JCC and she was a teacher and she was 85. I was taken by her, but then she left and retired. I like it, how about you? <laughs> and I ran into her again at the farmer's market and she told me, I've just fallen madly in love. And I thought, oh my God, you've fallen madly in love and I'm going through another breakup, what is your secret? So then I was intrigued and I said, we should meet once a week and have tea. And that's how it started. Hello. Hello. I went to the bakery and a very beautiful young woman walked in. I couldn't take my eyes off her. And uh, when she opened her mouth, it sounded, I'm going to have you. It, it just spoiled the whole thing for me. It made me realize that it's more than just a facial beauty that counts. It has to be more. I just fell in love with Risa. So why is beauty so important to you? Well, it's just a joy to look at beauty. Mm -hmm. I look at my children's wedding pictures. They mm -hmm. never got old. This young. We live in a world, at least I think America's very much, part of that is we just discard. If something doesn't work, we throw it out. There's so many times we see old people and um, we put them away in these dying places in America that I think there's no reverence. But I'm, I'm just wondering, all my friends are young except one, Paula. Mm -hmm. They're all young people like you. They want my friendship and I want theirs. I must have something to give to, it, to them. <laughs> she inspired me, yeah. I was born on November 1st, 1917. My mother died when she was 25. I was one week away from my first birthday. What is Risa's life saying? A stand-up doll is a doll that gets hit and the doll just bounces back, no matter what hit it takes, it just bounces back up. And to me, Risa's like the stand-up doll, which is the Stehoff Maten in German, which is a known term. And it just bounces back, and that's her, where a lot of people will be hit and knocked down by life. Risa gets up, and she gets up with an incredible attitude. She gets up with humor, she gets up with song. And I feel like we can all benefit for watching somebody, how they get up over and over again. I was born in Vienna. I was born in Vienna. Every branch, every leaf on the tree is so dear, so dear to me. I'm in love with Vienna. It was in March that Hitler and his gangs marched into Vienna. A 
as they're singing the song, there's a feeling of power and also um, self-righteousness. And I find that mentality horrifying and why that movement was so powerful. And I held on it because my son is about that age and is a little blonde, green-eyed boy with an Austrian father. And I thought, wow, how easy you can turn someone into this. My father had his first new car, a beautiful Steyr. And the first thing we saw that morning, the SS dragged the car out of the garage. My father never saw it again. I saw how people changed overnight. Then I looked out the window, and across the street there were two pianists that I used to love to hear practicing. And they were on the radio, they were quite well known. And that morning I looked out the window, and a woman poked out her tongue at me. And that was kind of insulting to me, and I had a feeling that worse things are to come. People don't believe that the Holocaust really happened, and that's why telling his stories are so important. The next day, they banged on our door with their boots. Open up! We opened up, and they came into my sister and my bedroom, and I was trying to dress myself. I was shaking like a leaf. I couldn't could hardly dress myself. And they came into our room and they ransacked the room looking for money. And they dragged my father out of the house into concentration camp. And I didn't see him again for 20 years. I loved my father. They came to our house several times. They, they just plundered and took whatever they felt like taking. They knew that we were helpless. They made me eat grass when they saw me on the street. They, they rounded up some very nice, Decent Jewish men, older men that were on their way to the temple, and they made them wash the floors. And the people were standing around laughing. On a Sunday morning, all dressed up in a white dress with red trimming and white shoes with red trimming, I remembered like today. And I walked to the nearby park. And on the way back, there were some SS men rounding up Jewish girls. And they asked me, are you Jewish? I said, yes. You're coming with us. You're going to wash the headquarters. So I walked with them, and they rounded up more girls. I was very good looking at the time, and there was one man who liked me, and he said, well, you know, they tell you you're going to wash the headquarters, but they're going to do some worse things to you. They're going to have sex with you, they're going to beat you, they're going to do terrible things. But you can get out of it if you make a date with me tonight at the Humboldt Park at 8 o'clock. But if you don't show up, I'll come for you at midnight and drag you away. So um, I had a boyfriend at the time who was not Jewish. And I told my sister, let's get out of here 
okay, I'm going to go there to see if he shows up. And then afterwards he told me that this guy was walking up and down, up and down, faster and faster. He really came to the house and banged on the door with his boots. And the maid answered and said, aren't you ashamed of yourself to make a date with a Jewish girl? He took off like lightning and he was never seen again. <laughs> because that was really punishing by Nazi law to make a date with a Jewish girl. So that's that story. I had a narrow escape. When I waited at the British consulate in line to get my visa, the Nazis were walking up and down and asking every person where they're going. Whatever they said, they answered, we'll be there too. They really thought they were going to conquer the whole world. And it was scary to hear that. I have been to Vienna since, like 40 years later, and I loved the city, but I couldn't stand looking at the people. I was born in South Africa. I was born during apartheid and left there because of the fear of the bloodbath. Everybody said the bloodbath is coming, we got to get out. And so we left and the irony is we came to America and I felt finally, oh my God, we can exhale. You will not us. You will not us. And now we're in America under a Trump regime. And now we're thinking we should get out. Maybe we'll move to Vienna, where my husband's from. And the irony is that Vienna now feels safer to bring up a child than America. So I told her recently, I said, Risa, I think we're thinking of moving to Vienna. And she said, no, no. And I said, why? I thought you forgave them. And she said, I have, but I just don't trust the Viennese and never will. My secret to long life is my attitude because anything I cannot change, I try to put aside. I turn it around and count my blessing. I would tell this generation that they're surrounded by beauty, by everything good, and that's the way to see life. My heart is beating. How many languages do you sing? Seventeen. I, I sang in about ten. Well, I was born in the city of music, and uh, even as a small child, I was always singing and going to my piano and figuring out tunes that I liked. And eventually I begged my father to allow me to get piano lessons. Music was always a big part of my life. My sister went to English classes and the English teacher, who was also my teacher in college, fell in love with her. And he was an Englishman, Jewish. When Hitler came, he went back to England and he sent for her. He got her a job, you know, the only way you could come to England is to have a job. So she had a, a domestic job, and then she got me a domestic job, and the people asked for me, sent me a visa, and I had to be a maid when I came to England. But they had two children, and they found out how good I am with kids, so I became the nanny, and they got somebody else to wash the floors and everything. I was in England nine years, 
I became friends with a very nice German woman and uh, came over to see her. And she said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm expecting my brother to come for the weekend. And he's usually very bored when he comes here. Then he came and he fell in love with me. And there was, became my husband. And one of the daughters of the person that gave us the affidavit lived in Los Angeles. When I came to Los Angeles, she got me my first job in a cooperative nursery school. There is so much enjoyment in doing what you love. And that really refers also to my two professions. I love teaching children. I had a lot to give to them. And I loved entertaining people and seeing them smiling and happy. You know, when I think back, I don't know how I did it. I kept house, mm -hmm. raised the children, took them to school back and forth, did the shopping, always had a hot meal on the table, taught school, as you know, for every day, 40 for years, every three day. Three till 3.15? Started to study accordion, wow. started to study voice. I did all these things. And I think that the one who suffered from it was my daughter. I shushed her a lot. Mm. I know a mother-daughter relationship can be wonderful and complicated. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to talk a little bit about your relationship with your mother, Risa. It just was, it was a hard, hard growing up. Mm. And very overprotective because of what they saw in their life and how the world wasn't safe to them. So over, over protecting me. If I could just say, okay, this is my dad and pull it out of my head, pull it out of my brain, pull it out of my, my whatever part of me this stuff is stored in or, or any of their old, any of the pain that my mom and dad had. I don't need to hold on to Holocaust pain. And yet I do. My mother passed away um, at the age of 24. But she was very educated, very ambitious, just very wonderful to my sister. And that's really all I know. Yeah. And uh, I'm visiting my family in Poland. I felt her presence there. The rest of my family was just exquisite too. Because none of them are there anymore. They were all taken away by the Nazis and killed. Which the book that I bought shows with all their names in there and with how old they were when, it, when their life was ended. I have a special book that I want to show you that my grandfather gave me and wrote in it. And all the ants, everybody wrote in that book. I'm very happy to write in your special book because I don't want to be forgotten. But I would prefer that I'm in your hearts because the book could get lost. Remember your uncle Isaac. Here's the song. It's a very beautiful song about a Jewish mother. She really cared about education and affecting young children because nobody really cared and took her under her wing. So that was one of her passions. Losing her mother when she was one and having an evil stepmother. She was very unfair to me especially. And my sister, who was already a little mensch, really resented her and fought her. A Jewish mother, there's nothing better in this world. How sad when she's not around. She had a stepmother, but she wasn't really like a mother to her. 
um, I, I, maybe in some ways, and then her dad was busy working and she was close to her dad and didn't, didn't get to see him too much. And um, I, I felt her pain growing up. I felt, I felt both of their pain, my mom and dad's pain. So I was a depressed little kid and a sad and lonely and um, and my mom didn't see what was going on and she didn't see the toll that her trying to get her needs met with entertaining and teaching. Uh, they both served different needs. Her entertaining gave her the attention and the positive, the approval and the, all the stuff she didn't get from when she was growing up that she needed and then teaching gave her molding little minds and whatever I didn't get growing up. She went after her dreams. She went after what she needed for herself. She got her needs met. Most people don't do that. Such a dear, dear mother, my mother. I don't want to blame her. Mm -hmm. I'm still working through forgiveness for what I didn't have, what I didn't get, what I needed. When she first discovered that she has breast cancer, she has always felt that chemotherapy and radiation takes so much away the good cells and all that, and she has seen people suffering, that she resolved she will never have either one of those. Isn't able to, to have a job because she's constantly working on her health. Once I release all that old stuff, all the negative self-talk caused by, I'm blaming, but caused by what I heard, whether it was my mom or my dad or my brother or the teachers or the whatever, if I can let go of all that stuff, I can really be who I came here to be, and be who I was meant to be, and do what I was meant to do. I was being impatient and not nice to her. And she expressed it to me, and that made me realize it. And that's not what my relationship with my daughter is. I love her, and I don't ever want her to feel hurt at anything I'm saying or doing. Mm, it's beautiful. You two can give each other this. Life is Very precious. precious to yes. me. And she's the best daughter anybody can have. She's the best daughter I ever had. <laughs> do you believe her? I do. There's almost a defiance in her getting up, which I love. And yet I also wondered if it's a form of denial. On one hand, it's like, you know what? I'm gonna choose joy. My mother died at one, but I'm gonna choose life. Uh, the Nazis came and took my father. I'm gonna choose life. I didn't have a career, I had to learn. I'm gonna choose song. On the hay, beneath young gewinnen, so the night me the reis getrieben. And I had noch kein 13 year gehabt. In the fremd. Do children, do they have favorite songs or? My children, yeah. my children kept completely apart from the accordion. My son, after his bar mitzvah, he wanted to buy a trumpet, but we said that's too noisy. So he took up the drums. <laughs> And the drums yeah. were so noisy <laughs> that he practiced it in his bedroom that we couldn't hear our own words when he was practicing. <laughs> Is he a musician today as well? He's a musician, oh, yeah. yeah. He played for Oingo Boingo at one time. My son would come to my house, give me a big hug, and then stand back and say, that's my mother. I feed on that.
is her happiness a form of denial, which I think that generation does have. Our generation goes into it and wallows and stays there and talks about things over and over. Where that generation was like, okay, someone died last week. I better get up and get on with it. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. Sarisa has this fridge, which are full of quotes to live by, inspirational life quotes, health quotes. We are never too old to be young at heart. Being young means simply being willing to be a beginner. Did you have all these quotes on your fridge when your husband was alive? No. And she goes to it and reads them and her daughter has helped her put up quotes. Do you change the quotes as life changes? Uh, maybe I read them more. This is her. This fridge is how she lives her life. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. I was still good to my husband, even though he was very weak, and he even lost some of his marbles. One time he threw his, his stroller at me. Why did he do that? Because I, did, I asked him to repeat what he had said. And I said to him, to my husband, is this how you repay me for taking good care of you? He said, what did I do? He didn't even know he, he threw that thing at me. So he was really, his mind was going, his body had several heart attacks and strokes. I cleaned up his mess and cleaned him up and gave him diapers and things. Till he finally went to the hospital and uh, he was unconscious. But I didn't, I did the hospital, dismissed him from the hospital. I asked him for a hospital bed that I had in my house and he was in a coma. And the hospices came and said, he's holding on to life. I can see he's holding on to the rails of the bed. You must tell him that you are okay, you are strong. It's okay for him to leave. I told him that we love you and it's okay to leave. We can manage. And then he, he passed away. And what I'll never forget is when the funeral people came, they had a big sheet. They put him inside the sheet and dragged him out and apologized. And that I'll never forget. That was a terrible thing. We love to look at the beauty of flowers, but as they begin to wilt and decay, people throw them out. And I actually think wilting flowers are also beautiful and to me a life and flowers are very symbolic. A friend of my husband's was in town from Vienna and he wanted to hear the old lost songs. I got them together. Two Viennese friends meet. Hello. You look lovely as ever. Thank you. Klaus, this is Risa. Risa, this is I'm very is pleased Klaus. to meet you. Hello. Happy to meet you. Hello. Too. Well, Klaus is such an amazing, intelligent Viennese man who loves music. You two are both musicians. Well, dee, da, dee, da, da, da. What was it? Just the last. Last tune to her. When he said, I lo would love to hear the old Viennese songs, I said, oh, I have someone who can play the old Viennese songs with you. 
Das Wandern ist das Müllerschluss. Das Wandern, das Wandern, ja. das Wandern ist das Müllerschluss. Das Wandern, das Wandern, das war sein Schlecker Sing, das Klingt, das Klingt. I could feel that, wow, this would be a great opportunity to let them have a conversation and see if Risa could forgive and could look at Klaus in a different way, because she did, but underneath that, what was still left. My son, Luca, a blonde, green-eyed boy who looks very... Austrian German uh, came along to help me film, and it's amazing to have him witness what I'm hoping will take place. The truth is about Klaus is that his father took him when he was 10 years old to see all the, all the concentration camps and it, it damaged him and he became obsessed with it and he had this incredible guilt and I think down the line or somebody in his family could have been a Nazi. Could you tell Risa what you were telling me about the Viennese? What, what in 1991 they always felt like the victim. You said. Yeah, they, 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 they survived by, by lying. They always said they were the first victims of Hitler, which, which is a lie, because they committed most of the crimes. We were not the victims of Hitler, oh. but we, we embraced him, we welcomed him, and we were the perpetrators. So, um, but this, this, was, this, this is as far as in 1991 that they were able to commit this this kid now it's now it's common knowledge and it's also taught in schools and now we know but but we we managed to escape by lying for 50 years yeah and and if you remember the one million people on, on the heldenplatz to, applauding to hitler's speech so so we 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 always have lied about our history this 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 is so he really doesn't want to be seen as a perpetrator. And so it was important for him to have that conversation. Bruno Kreisky, our most famous chancellor, the Jewish chancellor from 1970 to 1982, said that Austria is a, is a, a very, very beautiful country with very, very bad people. This is the tragic in Austria. But you can still feel you know, I mean, one conversation's not going to totally heal everything, but it gave them both a nice glimmer. Ich bin von Kopf bis Fuß auf Liebe eingestellt, denn das ist meine Welt und sonst gar nichts. I'm too many men. Yeah. I can, I, I and can yet understand. the young people don't really know about this. They, they know nothing. They do absolutely not interested. Yeah, they're they, not to blame either. Yes, but if you don't know where you come from, you can know who you are. That's true. So you have to be interested in, in the history of, of, of your tribe. But you can't feel guilty because you didn't do any. The young people. Yeah, and, and, and it, wasn't, it wasn't taught at, at school. Yeah. I, I never had it at school. We, want to we omitted it. We, we, we learned everything about old Rome and Greek and Phoenicians and, and something, but we stopped history, I think, in 1910. And then we graduated and went, and went to university. We, we, never, we never touched this. Dann gehen wir schlafen mit samt dem Affen. Friedlich oben wir zu drei, dann schlafen wir ein, gut war der bei. And in that moment, I had hope she forgave a little. I see my bored son and I think, right now he doesn't get it. But one day he will get the levity of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's really, I'm so glad you brought Klaus. Yeah, he's a... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I talked to her about it because it irritated me a little bit how important beauty was to her and her own vanity that she always asks, how do I look? What do you think of my belt and my hat before we leave the house? And I thought, Jesus Christ, at 99 at 100, are we ever gonna think, who cares? And there's something in women, this pressure to always look beautiful, to be presentable. And I thought, as human beings, when are we gonna fucking not care? this perception of how she like people say you're 100 and she's like yeah but I look 85 <laughs> how even at 100 you're trying to look younger with me to the mirror. Much younger than my age. Who cares about age? Humor is, there's a great quote on her fridge about humor. Humor is a tranquilizer without side effects. He who laughs, lasts. Love it. That's me, I last. <laughs> Over there? Before. Yeah, I suddenly grew wings. I'm going to fly away. Well, I like the idea of her being an angel and flying away. And I asked her where she'd like to fly to. I'll fly to Vienna. Vienna's still in her heart. To the giant wheel in the Prater. Now I went to Vienna again. I could look at them. Here I am looking at the past, the tanks, the guns, a Jew coming to find some sort of closure to the past as if I was Risa, and the Hitler pillow with daisies on it. Still baffled. How do we ever heal from this? It's hard, because I go to Vienna and I hear the Germans whispering in the other room. Well, my in-laws. The first time I went to Vienna and I was jet-lagged and I fell asleep, I woke up to the sound of whispering in German in the other room and I thought, where am I? And then I remembered. Riding up and down the streets of Vienna. Is this how Risa saw it? The present and the past merging into one? What a beautiful place. And yet, I can't look at the Austrians and see goodness in them. I try, but I see Vienna through Risa's eyes. And if the Viennese are not as joyous as they used to be, it's understandable too. Do you think it is possible to forgive? You can forgive because it was a mess hypnosis, but you shouldn't forget. And have you forgiven? Yes, I've forgiven because I don't want to live with hatred. I've forgiven them for being misled because that's what prejudice is. I left in August 1938. 
after being incarcerated by uh, by the Nazis for three and a half months in a Viennese prison. How old were you at the time? I was uh, 17 at the time. You know. I came in November 1940. So I don't know if you remember this, Risa, but you told me actually that Ralph confessed his love to you while you were still married. That's true. He. <laughs> One Friday night, I mean, I came there. He came every Friday night. He was invited by my husband. And one time, he pointed to under the table. He had a diamond ring waiting for me, beautiful ring. And uh, I went into the kitchen, and he went into the kitchen with me. And he hugged me and said, I love you. You make me feel so young. I'll never forget that. And that was the beginning. And I was still very beautiful then. I walked with high heels and had a beautiful walk. The reason I use younger images and cast someone to be Reese's younger self is I think people don't see the younger person in an older person. We forget that they were ever a baby, a young teenager, a young sexual woman. So to me, it was really important to add that element so you see the whole person. And I walked towards him in the cafe and he was watching my footsteps. <laughs> he was so romantic and beautiful. And after he declared his love for me, I ventured to visit him at his home. And uh, he hugged me and then he said, Risa, we cannot see each other anymore. I am not a marriage wrecker. I remember he, I told him, I called him and told him that my husband had passed away. And from that moment on, when he came home, he took care of me. Move over. Oh, you want to come over? Okay, sweetheart. Risa and Ralph always went to the spa and they would sit in the chair and they would hold each other and sing songs and everybody at the spa would go, oh my God, look at you guys, look at the love you have. And to see that uh, in two older people, I think it touched many people. I got all the time in <laughs> I have a few older friends and they say more and more they are touched less and less. This blouse was made in Vienna. Oh, that is beautiful on you. But I'm not sure that the belt is right here. I like the belt. I have all the was in a really bad accident and she's in intensive care. Ralph called me. I'm on my way to go see her. She was in the intensive care for three weeks. She needed eye surgery, she lost her hearing, hip replacement, skin graft on one side of her face. I look ugly. She couldn't walk, she had to learn to walk again. And in 93, I would have said, okay, that's it, I'm done. The first uh, two weeks, it looked very bad, it looked desperate. Uh, an immediate eye operation had to be performed uh, otherwise she would have lost the use of her right eye. Seven ribs were broken and uh, uh, a blood clot formed in the, on the head, which they were very afraid that it might be very dangerous. 
And I asked her, do you remember? And she said, in the coma, I just thought, there's so much love to come back to. And I said, what about the boy did, who hit you? She said, he didn't even have insurance. What can you do? She had no resentment, no anger, just. What happened in the coma? Are you, were you aware of, of what was happening during the coma? Were you aware? During the coma, I had a beautiful dream. My dream was that my living room was turned into a beautiful new pink room. And the people came, all kinds of people came there to see me. And I loved that pink room that my daughter made for me. <laughs> so I had a beautiful dream, at least that much. tummy in, right? Inhale, push the carriage all the way out. Straighten your hips and your knees. Push out. Good, good, good. Tummy tight. Whoa. <laughs> Does that feel too heavy? Does it feel too heavy? Push the carriage out. Now control it coming back. Okay, push out. Inhale, tummy drawn in every day she said well that's one of her secrets for living so long is she has exercised every day of her life and still does today i walked with the cane without any help that's great the therapist was walking next to me and said don't hold on to me and don't bring the walker i could manage on the just walking with the cane that's I did it. Great. <laughs> We're working on balance and different things, you know. You like I'm in being a very here? good place. Yeah, it looks very when good. When they said rehab, I was really worried because when my husband had to go to rehabs, my first husband, they were stinky, urine, urine smelly and dirty. This place is sparkly. You can eat from the floor. <laughs> And the nurses are nice. I'm really the only one who smiles. All the others are sour pusses. <laughs> All the other patients? Yeah. yeah I walked and down the hall. You know, I'm sure I have as many problems as they have. Yeah. And I really want to think about it. Well, I count my blessings. Yeah. And I'm loved by so many people, including you. I do consider Risa a blessing for me. I never had a close relationship with my grandmother. My other, I was named after my other grandmother who died. Uh, so I've always wanted a grandmother. And to me, I've adopted her as my own grandmother. She's just so warm, so loving to everyone she meets. And it's beautiful to be around somebody like that. Water at bedtime will also prevent nighttime leg cramps. Your leg muscles are seeking hydration when they cramp and wake you up with the Charlie horse. They all don't last, unfortunately. Nothing lasts forever. That's why I like artificial flowers. I don't have to take care of them and feel sad when they go. Yeah. Pink flowers, that's my sweet. Because I want to last forever, too. <laughs> as long as I'm healthy and as long as my friends are alive, too. What is on this hand and what is on this hand? Well, on this hand, it's for my marriage. And this hand is something that... I love how she wore one from each husband. So one is from her husband on one hand and one is from Ralph, who became her common-law husband because she didn't want to get married again. When I met 
Ralph and realised that the most important thing is friendship as a basis for love. Yes. <laughs> The only thing we ever argued about was who would die first. Who would and, die first? And he said, I want to die first. I don't want to be without you. And I said, no, I'm going to die first. I don't want to be without you. And that was the only argument we ever had. <laughs> How do you say so strong, Ralph? You don't get colds or? He's never missed a day since my accident in the hospital at here. Well, as I said. You would not want to be in a retirement home with, and, and over with there, all yeah. people who scream and cry. Yeah. No, I'm amazed when I look at some people who are in their 70s and they're wrinkled like yeah, prunes. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. And my face is... Yeah. Yeah. And especially now after this accident, which you have, you had your whole face restructured practically. Yeah. 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 This side is all plastic. Plastic, yeah. That's amazing. How does it feel when you touch it? Plastic. <laughs> no, I'm yeah. just it just it feels a little different from my yeah. skin. Yeah. yeah. But they did it a beautiful. Looks the same. Job. But it you can't tell you can. the people from the outside. You can't tell. You know, my son told me that when he heard about my accident, he rushed to the hospital and they led him to my room. He took one room. One look at me and say, that's not my mother, I'm in yeah, the wrong room. Yeah, I didn't room. recognize her, yeah. I was all swollen, yeah, yeah, bloody. Yeah, yeah. I was a mess. You came back well. And the doctors called my children and said, your mother's going to die. We're going to remove the tubes, there's no hope. My kids said, you don't know our mother, she's tough. So they didn't remove things and... Uh, for two months, uh, they worked on me in the hospital. If somebody were to give you a youth serum and said, Risa, you can return to youth, a if pill? If somebody gave me a pill that what? Returns you to youth physically, would you take it? Yeah, I would yeah. love it. You were, and why? Because there would be a mission. Uh, there would be additional admiration of me as a person, as a woman. Mm. And uh, I would attract people and have more choices. How are you? Tell me about this ordeal. I'm doing better every day. And uh, I'm able to get out of bed by myself. And I can dress myself already. The occupational therapist at the hospital helped me with that. I have lots of favorite songs from all different countries. One of my favorite songs is one that my father used to sing, and it did not dawn on me why he sang that song until recently. Because the song says there are so many things in life that we have to forget. They are too beautiful to be true. Because you can't imagine the happiness you feel. But fate says no. That's when my young mother at 25 died. And he's singing that song, remembering and finding an answer, trying to find an answer. This is a picture of the three people that I loved so very much who died within a year and a half. I think she lost her daughter first, and she knew that was coming because she'd been dealing with breast cancer for a while. And then suddenly her son died. My son could have lived if it hadn't been for the doctor, mistakes. Blocked artery, the doctor fixed the block artery and made a hole in his heart and didn't know. The doctor came to see him every week, didn't say anything about the fact that he blew up and became three times his size. Mm. Then we transferred him to UCLA. 
And by the time UCLA discovered the hole, all his vital signs had closed up and he had to die. So I went to see him and I said to him, David, you're strong, you're going to get well, and you will count, you will sing my praises when my time comes to leave this world. And he opened his eyes and looked for me. And the nurse who happened to be in the room had to leave the room, she was crying. She really thought he was gonna live, and I thought he was gonna live at the rehab. They just had to bring his body down and get all the fluids out. I thought I'd have time to interview her son. He was young, he was a musician. That's the last thing I thought I'd have to worry about was interviewing her son and that he would die. Of course, Ralph, it was very unexpected when he passed on. He went up 16 stairs, lost his balance, fell down the stairs and died instantly. He smashed his brain. That was my love, the love of my life. There was a week or two there where her voice was so frail and I could feel the grief and I asked her, do you cry? Are you releasing this grief? What are you doing? And she said, I can't cry. After he passed on, after my daughter passed on, and finally my son, Risa, I thought would, that would be it. I thought Risa had three months left after everyone she loved died. And when I went over, I found her reading the cards they had all given her, reading to me all the ways they loved her and showing me, look what Heinze said to me, look what Ruthie said to me, look what David said to me, I'm so lucky. Me to appreciate all the wonderful family in my life and it kept me strong. I never cried, I never complained to my friends, and they couldn't even imagine to lose their children or anything like that. It's really up to us. We can take life and these tragedies that happen to us and turn it into defiance, making us who we are, or we can let them eat away at us. I did not want to be sad. I just did not. I didn't want to destroy myself. So all I could do is count my blessings that Ralph and my wonderful children were gone. I couldn't bring them back. And that was one of my philosophies, that anything you cannot change, you have to forget. They were so loving, all three of them. I miss that, but I cannot dwell on it because that's not my way of thinking. So in a sense, I think hardships are your gifts, if you know how to use them. Well, this poem was written by my daughter, who loved to do poetry, and who loved me very much. But she writes about life, and the poem is called Life Goes On. People are born, and life goes on. People cry, and life goes on. People lie, and life goes on. People lay down and die, and life goes on. No matter what goes on, life goes on. It doesn't stop when or because we hurt or when we're sad. It doesn't stop when we're disappointed or mad. Nor does it stop because we may want it to. Life goes on, with or without us, life goes on. It doesn't ask us, life just goes on. Charles Dickens wrote in Great Expectations, do we remember life as it happened or as we wished it had happened? And I find that fascinating with memory and with Risa. I, it doesn't come to my mind right away, but I do know something from his opera Fidelio. Ooh. Uh -uh. No, not that one. She will 
remember songs and then she will not remember what she did yesterday. I'm just hoping to go to bed one evening and not wake up, not know anything, just gone. And people will come, Laurie, my neighbor, will call, and there will be no answer. And Victoria will say she's gone forever. I like to go peacefully in your sleep. Yeah, that's what that I'm hoping the best. for. Yeah. And I look beautiful. <laughs> I will bring flowers and put them on. You know, my daughter me. looked so beautiful after she passed on. Yeah? What made her look beautiful? No more pain. Put a year, de cette instant suprême. Combien j'ai pu souffrir, mais bien mon amour. J'attends ce jour de tout mon cœur, si triste dans son ombre. Just like a stand-up dog. Feeling blurry as she gets older, a little out of focus. The reason I wanted Risa to dance is because, again, I don't think we look at older people as having life left in them, as having sexuality, as dancing. Some play games in love, yeah, holes in their heart. To me, it was so important to see that chutzpah, that zest for life. Never see the light until you walk through the dark. Disappear with age just because of the shell we wear. You wouldn't think she had just been in rehab with skin cancer and her leg infected. Every patient, no smile, no posture, no joy, joy of the weave, the joy of living. Yeah, I was nervous to interview her about sex because it took many years. <laughs> it's been 10. I think I wore her down to talk about sex. And I said, Risa, this is really going to help other people who know that your sexuality doesn't disappear when you're 98. Risa still has a sex drive. There was a guy that I enjoyed talking to. He was intelligent. And I really, we met several times in Tom, but he became attracted to me sexually. And uh, he tried to persuade me to have sex with him. He took out his penis, which was this long and very firm, to, uh, to show off with it. He asked me to touch it. it was, I touched it. It was very firm. I said, put it away. I'm not interested. I was not interested in this person as a sex person. It's strange. I enjoyed this conversation. He was nice looking, he was but there was no spark. Told him to put that thing away. She had a lover at ninety-eight, a younger man who they met, and she is craving the closeness, the intimacy. Her and Ralph would still have a sexual relationship. And she said her son gave her a massager, which she used as a vibrator. There was a time when I didn't see Robert. I was really glad I had the vibrator. My son gave it to me as a massager, because uh -huh. that's what it actually is. But it vibrates and it really is. 
Does satisfy the needs. Entre tes parents. Try not to do it too often so that I can have a, what is it called again? Orgasm. An orgasm. So what would you like? What would make the sex more pleasurable for you? If my partner would not be as big. Undesired by somebody who's, who could be my grandson. When you were younger, did you have a good sexual appetite? Yes. Yeah. I was very sexy. Yeah. I had lots of sex problems. Yeah. Um, I had told him on the phone a couple of weeks before, I'd like to see him, but no sex. Mm -hmm. So he came and he really behaved quite well for quite a while. It was talking and enjoying each other's company and then I asked him to give me a kiss he said you know what's going to happen if I kiss you <laughs> and it really happened and I don't enjoy it I did not enjoy it and I realized I did it just for him and I decided it's not good enough to do something just for the other person. I found it sad that at 99 or 98, Reese is having sex with a man and still it's for him. When a woman going to learn? This is Dana from Lifeline and you didn't fall down. My necklace fell down. Oh, your necklace fell down? I do not need help. And you do not need help. Okay, are you Reese? Eiffelfeld? Yes, I'm Risa Eiffelfeld. Oh, Risa Eiffelfeld. Okay, so you didn't, this is Dana from Lifeline, and you didn't fall down. I appreciate your call, but I'm fine. Okay, and you didn't fall? I took my blouse off, and unfortunately, the necklace fell on the floor. Okay, so you didn't fall on the floor. I did not fall. Oh. <laughs> you know, they're making a big fuss about my 100th birthday. I don't even know if I reach it. You're gonna reach it. <laughs> so Risa was a, a early childhood education teacher at the Jewish Community Center School in West LA for over 50 years, so it's a big deal. And then the mayor has come and the city attorney and they plan to give her an award when she turns 100. For, not for turning 100, but for being a beautiful, caring human being in the lives of children. That's you know, there's a meeting. fascinating statistic. People either die right before, like the day before, or a the week or two after because they want to make it. You know, it's interesting. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I care. Any time I can fall asleep and not wake up. What are you wearing for your birthday? I'm going to wear a black skirt a white blouse with very nice jewelry and a very special jacket. You want to see them? Yeah. I don't want anybody else to see that outfit. It's very elegant. This is the <gasps> jacket. Beautiful. This is the blouse. Oh, beautiful. And this is the skirt. I love it. Risa, I haven't heard from you. Please call me back. I'm worried about you. I'm very worried that Risa won't make it to her 100th birthday. She hasn't been feeling well lately. I called her last week and she didn't call me back for a few days. And I, I was worried then. I thought, oh my God, I told my husband, oh my God, I think maybe Risa died. Uh, so every time I call her, I'm afraid that she passed away. How's Risa doing today? Well, today she's a little, you know, she has a little pain in the neck. But this morning, I don't know, something happened and she started to like feel chills. 
see you. I don't want you to stress. Oh. No, no. This is the soup. You can toast. Okay, your bread. I toast the soup. <laughs> no, the bread. Toast this. Okay, don't eat like that. Make tasty. Well, that way you can, you can eat it, Risa. <laughs> and other than that, take your pill. The prescription Lord is going to bring later. Okay? You need to eat. Because they may... But they say, feed a cold and starve a fever. Okay. But the soup would be good. Yeah. You need something. It's a starvation soup. <laughs> <laughs> okay? When looking back at the footage and the videos of you, I feel like these last years have been your happiest years of your life. There were very lonely days. I mean, I did have my dear friends coming, like you. All young friends that I really enjoyed. But uh, I can't say that those years were my best years. My best years were when times he was alive. Mm. Yeah, those years were priceless. It's a happy feeling that I can be myself and I have a leisure and I'm well taken care of by a very caring person. So there are moments when I really appreciate that. But then when she leaves and if no one is scheduled to visit, I feel lonely. I fill it out with watching a movie, playing the piano, doing crossword puzzles, partly to keep my mind alert. But then there are moments when I felt someone else. I'm happy, and at times a little lonely. Okay. And what I want from you is a hug. Oh, you need a hug. Okay, one second, Risa. Let me. It was strange because as she approached 98, I thought, oh my God, she's going to die. And the ravens came out in the park where I took a walk. And I thought, Risa's going to die. I see the ravens. Didn't die. I turned 99. The butterflies came out and started landing on me, and I thought, this is a symbol, Risa's going to die. And Risa didn't die. And as her 100th birthday approached, I thought, OK, this is it. And the birds came, the butterflies, all these symbols that life is ending. Fear of her death, of how will I feel when she dies, I realized I'll be OK because I've seen what a rich life she's lived. 97, 98. 99 and a half. Here she is again, making it to her 100th birthday. And everybody from her life has come to celebrate her. And for the first time, I see Risa flooded with so much emotion. This emotion that she's been holding in. Her grandson's there, singing to her. Tell you some of your know how important I am, did you? So then everybody comes to her. She's in this big armchair, and everybody comes and kisses her. So maybe that should be the end. Life keeps going on. Enjoy yourselves. You're younger than you 
think enjoy yourselves while you're still in the pink the years go by as quickly as a wink enjoy yourselves enjoy yourselves you're younger than you think enjoy yourselves enjoy yourselves you're younger than you think <laughs> That's Risa. That's the whole story. Never see the light until you walk. 